Hi, my name is Kerry Mussington. I am the founder and director of the Mind Over Matter project, also known as the Mom Project, suicide prevention, mental health awareness. The reason why I do suicide prevention is because it doesn't matter what comes forward. You don't know what the reason is why someone is feeling in a state of panic and despair. Um, sorry. Okay, so what's bringing me here today is because I, you know, I take those calls when I get a message that says, I need your help. I need your help. What's well, my Sunday afternoon? I ain't even had one off yet. I ain't had no time off yet. I got up, been out, had a, had a laugh, took the dog out, come play with the snow. Um, if uh, Jean-Louis would know that I was in his group because somebody just texted him saying I'm in his group live. <laughs> um, yeah, I've come into JDA Fitness and Lifestyles uh, because uh, I like to reach out with these people that are struggling with their health. Um, it may be diet, it may be alcohol, it may be drug, it could be anything. But let's start with alcohol. Alcohol is destroying so many families. It is... Somebody is in a bottle, but the outsiders are not in that bottle. So what I mean is that the whole life can be wrapped up in a bottle of um, using it as a crutch, as a part of self-harm. That's the way I look at it, self-harm, because it's used as a crutch to mask over the problems. Um, the problem that I have when I'm speaking to people and they've got alcohol in them is that some of them have got they've got children um, or grown children or not grown children, either or, it's affecting the children. And when a parent says that they don't want to tell their, their loved ones what's going on or, or about their, their problems, they think that's the end, that's it. They, they're the only ones that knows, I won't say nothing, but yet meanwhile their sibling or their child, should I say, is actually experiencing exactly the same thing, but just on the opposite. You know, um, they think that don't speak, they don't speak about it and that it will go away. When there's a problem with alcohol, there's a problem with emotions. And when there's a problem with emotions, there's a problem with uh, getting up and commitment. And when there's a problem with commitment and getting up, then the problem with the alcohol continues. Vicious cycle. Because you feel the self-worth is gone. Gives me great pleasure to be able to speak to an entire family when it comes to alcohol and depression and feeling rather deflated about life. You can't deal with just the one individual. You have to deal with their surroundings and who is around them. But let me just get this right, because when I was speaking to uh, these individuals, when they sit there and they wait for mental health services, what I know about the mental health services is that when you go and you go to your GP and you tell the GP, I don't feel very good, I, I'm, I'm having bad thoughts, etc., they will put you onto secondary mental health care to go and get assessed by a psychiatric, a psychiatric evaluation um, and then signed off whether or not they're going to give you treatment or some antidepressant to, to uh, subdue the situation. Um, therapy, what does therapy look like? Now, the, the problem that I said to the lady and gentleman is that what we have here is that when you go to the mental health services, you're going for you. So you're their client, you're their patient, you're their outpatient, you are for them. You're going for you. So when you go to your loved ones and say, I've got an appointment tomorrow, you have, but your loved ones don't. And yet your loved ones are going through the same trauma. Your loved ones are experiencing depression in the right behind closed doors, not having anyone to speak to. At least that's what I got.
because they're too concerned for the person that is supposed to be their role model. The children are forgotten and expected to um, cope or just, or I don't think it's expected, I think it's more like, uh, if I don't say, they won't know, but that's not the case, they always know, they're, they're not, they just don't like, because they know they've lost their mother or their father into drink, into drink, things have changed, do you know what I mean, the, maybe the companionship's not there anymore, maybe there's not much to talk about anymore, maybe it's the same rhetoric all the time, and somebody wants that to stop, and there'd be another story, so the thing is where when I deal with people, it's nice to uh, speak to the their uh, family around them as well because it's nothing better than hearing a child say, thank you, I've just been understood. And then you relay that back to the parent and say, do you know what's just been un uncovered? What are you going to do now? Are you going to have a date? And we're going to have a checkbook and we're going to have a uh, checkbook, a checklist and we're going to make sure that we're structured and tasks set you. So tomorrow, I expect you to check back in. Are you going to call me? Oh, no. Oh, no. The work starts with you, love. I'm not doing any running. And this is the thing that I know, that when you are mentally unwell, yeah, you expect people to chase you all the time. It cannot go like that. If you want the work, you want the help. Um, oh, my gosh. Sorry, I'm live, of course I'm fine. Um, if you want the help, um, then you have to reach out for the help. Now, they did a mar remarkable reaching out for help, it was the first step of, okay, I got a text, hey, I need some help, second, second is, let me make a phone call, because they did the first step, so I'll do the second step. The third step would be, let's talk openly and honestly, no secrets here. And um, no judgment, because at the end of the day, we're trying to resolve the problem, not the past problems. We resolve the immediate problem, which is the alcohol. The alcohol, if we can get that clean head, we can deal with other stuff. So really, there is a commitment to change. This person went from two bottles of vodka to one bottle of vodka and now down to wine which wine actually does more damage than the vodka i have to be honest i used to do the vodka myself uh when i used to do the vodka or oh, believe me it, it just got it's like water in the end but when you go on to wine it was terrible it's worse the worst feeling get more of a headache and everything else the next day so you, you really if you're going to go tito or somewhere along along the line you have to be in control of the alcohol. The alcohol cannot be in control of you. And so therefore replacing alcohol is a tough and tall order, but it has to be replaced. Now, one of the things that I suggested is that um, steps to recovery is to get therapy. And I've recommended two people. I could have helped myself, but I feel that I've done that first step right. And yes, it can be my methods. But when they want to go into something deep, which is not of my remit, I don't recommend it. I don't recommend them going backwards. Some people feel that they need to address it because it gives them closure. But I don't recommend going backwards if you know the outcome is that you're all right now. But revisiting it can cause trauma. And when you're revisiting it and you're having alcohol still, then you're more likely to drink more alcohol on top of it because you are don't know how to cope with it. So I don't know about going into that therapy, uh, deep indulging the really traumatic things that happened because we can't change that. But what you're looking for is a future and what you're going to do in that future. How can I get well without the alcohol? How can I get healthy? One of the things that was asked of me, and um, this is, I'm gonna have to say it. One of the things they said, could I replace the alcohol with a herb? And my remit is, to be honest and frank, 
that's my truth. It might not be theirs, it might be not be somebody else's, someone what disagree. There's always gonna be somebody that agree disagrees with this, that, and the other. But unless you've lived in the situation that we've been in, with we're highly trauma traumatized, gone through things that you never will comprehend, then we'll try anything to remove those negative thoughts from our shoulders. But let it be a healthier, healthier option to remove negative thoughts. Alcohol, once that's got hold of you, sorry, it's hard to get it out of your system and you turn beast with it. Some people can turn an absolute beast on alcohol. They can turn aggressive, they can be argumentative, they can fall asleep, they can risk the house and put the house on fire, all of those things that can happen. They can neglect their children as well as neglecting themselves. You can have functioning adults, uh, uh, alcoholics, and you can have non-functioning function alcoholics. Unfortunately, the problem with alcoholics is they are killing off their bodies. The problem is with that we have here, when the woman suggested that she'd rather have a spliff or she'll change it for, to a spliff because she was trying to look at her coping mechanism, replacing one thing to another. I know as a survivor that we've done that throughout. We replace one coping strategy, then we go and do another coping strategy. And then that will be health unhealthy. Then we try and move on to something a bit more subtle, subtle and so on and so on. And throughout your life, you will replace one method to another. But they do get healthier choices. For me, I would rather her smoke a joint rather than smoke alcohol. Because alcohol, um, for me, uh, kills off your uh, immune system completely and um, causes major organ failures, fa failings or also irritable bowel um we discussed that too like irritable bowel you know alcohol it's gonna mess everything up alcohol so it has to be replaced so one of the things that i asked to um what they should go on um is to go and see their gp to refer them to uh, a treatment for alcohol and drug addiction but we're dealing with alcohol here and one of the things that they can do is get a medication that helps people to stop drinking. Um, naltrexone, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce these words properly. Um, naltrexone or Vivitrol, can't say the other word, is the first and it's spelled V-I-V-I-T-R-O-L. Um, you know, it's the first line treatment for alcohol misuses, meaning it's tried before other medications, you see? So they've done a research on it, <laughs> research on it. Well researched and document, hint, hint, nowadays. Um, it is most effective if you're able to stop drinking before taking it. But if you, but you can still start using naltrexin tablets whilst you still while you are still drinking. The problem that it might even be the wrong one, but the the thing about disulfiram for the counter. The thing about ah, uh, is there a pill that makes you sick? That's the one, isn't it? The thing about the tablet is that this I can't even say this word. I'm not even going to begin to say it. Antabuse. Changes the way your body breaks down alcohol. If you drink while you're taking it, you will get sick. That's the one that I know that, um, I think there's another word for it, but uh, one of our members that we recommended, they go through turn and point and have medication for it um, to make them sick if they were going to drink alcohol uh, was a, a good thing that they had because they are now alcohol free. It's been two years and you might have seen them on the MOM project, uh, Mental Health Awareness Real Talk, giving their, her, their story about alcohol and addiction and almost losing their children, let alone their life to alcohol addiction. So alcohol addiction, we know what alcohol is and we know what it does and we know it destroys lives and family. It doesn't care who its victim is, does it? And I know I started taking alcohol at a very early age at school and it never stopped. And I want to talk about my experience. Um, I keep thinking about those school days. Um, you know, you're a teenager and you're trying to numb in the outside world and what's going on in your family life and your home life. And of course, you've seen the alcohol around your family. So you steal a few bottles or two when they're not looking and you take them to school. That's how it all starts. So if it's in your house, be mindful 
because there was a time when I was very young, I used to be babysitting somebody else, but they had a stock full of alcohol. So when they weren't looking, this is me babysitting and I'm drinking alcohol. Well, nobody taught me anything different. You're just a cool kid back in the blinking 70s, you know what I mean? So there I am babysitting and I'm drinking alcohol. Kids are in bed, aren't they? But I'm drinking alcohol and I'm drunk. And I'm babysitting John was almost child. And I'm a kid. <laughs> Not to mention what come out with that. Two, alcohols, two alcoholics coming back. So do you got alcoholics leaving their kids? Leaving kids with kids? Who the kids are becoming alcoholics behind the babysitters back and behind their own parents back. So this is where the alcohol started coming into play. Cool. The amount of times I used to vomit it out my parents' bedroom window, snuck out and I've been drinking or whatever, and the next minute my head's spinning. Oh my god, this room is going round. How am I gonna stop this? Okay, put one leg on the floor, one leg on a bed. How am I gonna stop this? My head the room. You spin me right round, baby, right around, like a record, baby, right around. <laughs> you got the point. So and then the next minute you're like <clears throat> out the bedroom window. So um and then your mum will go, Kerry! Yes, mum! Like, nothing's up. <laughs> you know? And so, um, yeah, they were not very good. You know, the amount of times I used to go clubbing it and uh, always drink, and it would be like those oranges, uh, those orange juices and things. Anything that was cheap. If it was cheap, I would drink it. It didn't care what it was. Pop and gin. That's what reminded me of the babysitting. So those drinks that I actually uh, would, uh, vomited on, I wouldn't touch again. Um, so, you know, can't stand the smell of vodka, although that used to be my juice, but now, nope. Can't smell or stand the smell of it. It just brings back so many bad memories. And, and everybody else that was in that frame of drinking that, that, that drink as well, bad memories, nothing good in them. Um, so yeah, with drinking alcohol, uh, had it paid a heavy price drinking alcohol, a high heavy price drinking alcohol. It cost me, it cost me um, my life, it cost me my sanity. And it cost me my um, my vagina. Um, it cost me my body. Uh, it cost me my dignity. It cost me my reputation. It cost me everything, really. Uh, I'm drinking alcohol because one thing leads to, leads to another. Um, and you mask everything. And what I was doing was a child that was masking everything. I went into an adult masking everything. Went in, even down to teenager. I masked everything. And through alcohol. Never saw myself as an alcoholic, but I certainly wouldn't pass up an opportunity of having a drink. But in the morning, you would feel absolutely horrible and spend most of the day sleeping, um, and perhaps the next day recovering from alcohol. So when you do drink alcohol, it takes so long to just recover from it. Um, you're drained, you're dehydrated, you know, um, there was a lot of things that used to go on drinking out a hole used to come up with cold sores as well that was another thing you know so um thank god i don't have them anymore touch wood <laughs> you know and um virus isn't it? your immune system's down so drinking alcohol it really is a killer um what are the first signs of liver damage generally symptoms of alcohol and liver damage in cords includes um abnormal Pain and tenderness, dry mouth, increased thirst, fatigue, jaundice, which is a yellowing of the skin. <laughs> You're not going to tell the difference between them and me then, are you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, loss of appetite and nausea. Uh, your skin may look abnormally dark or light. You may fit. Your feet or hands may look red. You know, um, it ain't a joke alcohol and you know what you know what they you make me sick let me tell you what made me sick the government says that cigarettes is bad but cigarettes don't smack someone in the mouth do they the government says that cigarettes are really bad for you but cigarettes don't create domestic violence do they the one damn thing that's left on the shelf that the government refused to move, remove is the alcohol. It's there on display. It's teaching the children. It's bringing them into it. It's a pharmaceutical drug, isn't it? That's the one thing that's always on display. But yet you've got to ask for a packet of cigarettes because they could kill. Well, so does bloody alcohol. It gives criminal records, puts people in prison, tears people's family apart, 
destroys love lives. It, it, it makes people sell their bodies. It's 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 a mask for um for Dutch courage to beat the shit out of people. Sorry, I said it. Sorry, pleaded out that word, but this is reality, real talk. I don't pretend to be anybody else. Disclaimer: I'm Kerry. Yeah. But what, you know, this is just me. I'm giving you the real honest baggage of even some of my past, you know what I mean? Let alone everybody else's that I can hear along the way. But what I know about alcohol, it destroys, it doesn't just destroy. You know what I said to that person tonight? What I said to that person tonight, I said, you remind me of my mum. They go, thank you. I went, yeah. Only thing is, I feel what, what, what your uh, child is going through. I feel that I'm that daughter. So I'm able to relate to how your child may be feeling. And and they did say, you're the only one that's got through to her. You're the only one she's re that they've related to. So I was quite happy and quite pleased that the family have come together to address um, the situation. But if you're gonna help someone, you can't just give them one tool. You have to give them a whole package of therapy. It can't just be, hi, Barbara, check in today and I won't see you till next week. When someone's in recovery, it does have to be a constant check-in for a little while. So they've got everything structured and planned. Got your appointments all up to date. You've got your diet plan sorted out. You've got a structure of what you're going to do today. Ask the person to treat yourself as a reward for reaching out. They couldn't see how to validate themselves and give themselves something back. They found that the most difficult thing to do was give something back to themselves as a reward for even reaching out today. That was the most difficult thing for them to do. Was to pamper themselves, was to treat themselves, to, was to reward themselves. You know, for me, I feel that they beat themselves so down, they don't, they don't think they deserve anything good. Well, they do. They deserve a life of abundance and they deserve the help and they shall get it. So, you know, it's quite nice to be able to be in a position of helping people, but giving them therapy options and solutions. Um, and those solutions are, do we know where to send you? Do you know where to go? Who's going to be in your best interest? So what I did is I give the lady, because I know a couple of therapists and, and psychotherapists and specialists. So I gave the lady, um, I said, would you like this person? Or would you like this person? And I expl explained the background of this person. And I explained the background of this person. And they chose um, a particular person to deal with their particular case. And so that was a, that was nice to give them a choice. So they know what they're going to be getting themselves into. So uh, I think helping raise awareness in the community is waking up the community. It is enabling people to reach out to me on a personal level, not so much on a business level, but because I don't make myself available in that, hey, come and knock on my office and make an appointment. I haven't done that, have I? <laughs> no, I make myself accessible. <laughs> because at the end of the day, I know that if somebody needs to talk, then they need to talk. So um, talk that we do give them. Now, one of the things that we ask, if there is any, any immediate danger or anything where they are at, danger um okay uh so if they're at danger then we have to make sure that we've got the right safety in, involved and make sure that their safety is okay but in this case that wasn't a worry the case the safety was more or less i think the lady had got to the end of a tether and uh realizes that they need change and change starts within doesn't it so um well done to them uh, so uh, cat's out of the bag now, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, they're all going to be working as a unit now because they're, there's the understanding. They've come together for the first time and now there's the understanding and now the journey begins, the process of recovery. So let's go from there. So yeah, um, yeah, alcohol, I don't think alcohol, alcohol, Perhaps you should have a card, <laughs> a voucher. How much alcohol you can spend during the week. Do you know what I mean? Perhaps you should have a voucher. Um, purchase it at your own risk, but you should sign a disclaimer. Um, if you're purchasing that, that you, you, oh, I don't know. That's a stupid idea, isn't it? But at the end of the day, it's a stupid idea, isn't it? But at the end of the day, the alcohol that's on the shelves, 
they don't seem to shut it down. It's okay using that fruit during COVID. That's not essential during COVID, is it? To some alcoholics, yes, very essential. Some people die if they're not if they're just going to come off of alcohol like that because people think, oh, just stop the alcohol and you'll get better. It don't work like that. An addiction doesn't work like that. Stopping the alcohol needs replacing with something positive. When everything's negative, they can't see beyond the bottle. So we have to remove that bottle somewhere. Mm -hmm. Get some little bit of a vision so we can start implementing change. Rules, structure. The funny part about it was during the conversation that they put themselves, that the, the family member onto me is that they go, oh, oh I'm, I'm just going to, no, this is my time. And you've just borrowed my time. So if you borrowed my time, you're going to listen to what I've got to say. Mm -hmm. And then um, take it from there. Yeah. So, you know, if I'm going to give up my Sunday afternoon, then uh, I hope that was worthwhile. It was to me anyway. I made a difference. I could hear, I could hear the uh, enjoyment. I could hear the message where they've said thank you. So, um, one day I will uh, play that back because they're going to come back. And um, I've given them lots of things to do, lots of tools, lots of tricks, lots of positive inputs of the things they could do. Um, because one of the things about it is that they don't have a f anything to do. No, fo no focus, no vision. And want to be doing something. And that's the thing, isn't it? People need to feel useful, like they're doing something. So we need to find that hobby. We need to find that desire to get up in the morning to do the things that they like. And that's the thing, isn't it? When you're getting up with somebody else, hmm. But when you have to get up and show up for yourself, you do find the enjoyment and the pleasure in showing up for yourself every now and again. If I didn't show up for myself, I'd be right where those phone calls are today. Can you help me? I can't speak. I'm I need the mental health. You know, do you know what it was like? And nobody actually shoo me the way, but hello. Nobody actually um, shoo me the way. And all throughout that time of going through mental health, it was hard for people to relate because I was being discriminated in one spe in, a se in a sense as well. And I was dealing with people that probably perhaps didn't understand what discrimination was. But when I was going through the, the mental health um, service at this point, I realised that I would just speak to one person after another after another and regurgitating myself over and over again. And then when they would say, OK, we'll give you some therapy. And the therapy would come into recovery college, which would be you would do some drawing or something like that. So creative arts. I got the concept of that. But I felt that a lot of people are misguided what they think they're going to get when they go to therapy. And you've got to ask what is the approach when going to therapy or the therapy that you want to receive? Because people have an idea that therapy means going back to what happened to you as a child. Um, it means going back into something perhaps that you've experienced that you perhaps won't, don't want to revisit. And it's not necessarily always the case. It isn't always the case. What they do, and people say, well, why do they ask me about my background? Because the background is very relatable. If you've come from... Uh, how can I read mine out? I don't have it handy. If you've come from a background where perhaps both your parents were alcoholics, for example, and uh, your uh, parents were incarcerated, then you're more likely to not have had any stability, right? Um, you might have come from domestic violence, etc. So it's about what the eye has witnessed. What is the eye have witnessed that is causing the trauma and the fear? So what the, um, the behaviour therapists look at, or any kind of therapist, is looking at your behaviour. Where is it coming from? What's learned? How are we going to get overcome? Now, my approach is a raw approach. It's a holistic version and it's based on my own lifestyle. My own, sorry, not lifestyle, my own um, upbringing, really. The things that were missed in the system of how one could have been helped. And so I think one could have been helped with the correct structure and planning. And this is what I was saying, that you're, you're, when somebody goes to the appointment, 
to the mental health appointment that that appointment is just solely for that person so what about the children that are witnessing this um this disturbance and things that are going on in the house where is their help did they get therapy no are they even noticed when it comes to appointments no the only time children get a mention is if mum or dad is is confiding to the local authorities about something awful that they were going to do which may consist of injuring the children or injuring themselves so if, if the authorities think that you're a danger to yourself or a danger to your children then there will be intervention as so, far as uh, safeguarding referrals and that means they should be going to every agency that does health a mental health service a social services welfare check welfare checks are very important when somebody is feeling um unstable and when someone is feeling unstable it's important that all hands are on deck and nobody we know what uh, is going on with such individual but the problem what we do with with welfare checks is that nobody checks back up because with a welfare check is it's offloaded to somebody else and offloaded so you've got a ring of people that's supposed to know about it but who's immediately taking full ownership of that welfare and so therefore we do have a waiting list and that's where the mental health comes into it uh here we go we're going to signpost you and that's where people are sitting in the background had a crisis and waiting on mental health there's a solution rather than waiting on mental health please do look do your research there are lots of people advertising their therapies in these groups and what they do make sure they're registered make sure they're kosher but second of all if they're offering a free conversation it's free conversation just be careful what you disclose but it is a free conversation until you do your due diligence um you know it's i think a crisis is a crisis and when when a community is all hands on when there's no NHS or nothing that you can get forward, get 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 at the finger, your fingertips right here and right now, then we have to find those solutions, such as therapists, private therapists, and workshops and creative workshops. And um, so there was plenty of solutions put on the table. But if you're interesting interested in a workshop, then we are going to be putting those workshops on because I don't think there's enough education around alcohol. There's not enough education around what families can do in rega regards to um, alcohol abuse and addiction. Um, and I think there needs to be so much more. I know that there is the AA. The AA's approach is, again, it's, again, a group setting. And because it's a group setting, you kind of, because you're on display, and I think this is one of the things about checking in as well. You're on display. You've got nowhere to run. So when you're doing a group setting, you, you become a family kind of thing. And everybody's rooting for you. So when you do slip, you know that you've got to face them. But because they're in the same boat, there's not really that much judgment. There's not that judgment because they understand. But for me... You, you can only can make so many excuses. There's only so many excuses that you can make, but you have to acknowledge that the destruction is not just about you. It's those in your immediate circle as well. And taking your own life when you feel that you're hopeless is uh, not helpful because you then continue the cycle all over again and it's left. You leave that scar tissue and that pain with the loved ones that you leave behind. So don't think you're doing anyone a favour by quitting that way. The toughest part was reaching out. That was the uh, the toughest part. The next steps, they're going to be difficult, but they're not going to be half as tough as you opening up to say, hey, I have a problem. I'm ready to deal with it. 